Cedar Valley, and that you would just help us to be a blessing to this community, Lord. So we just thank you and everything that you're doing in this place. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be here. Wow, that was like echoey. So good to be in church this morning. Can we give God praise? Every week we give God praise when I come up here because I like having the buffer where we clap. It gives me a chance to get settled in, to be honest with you, but also we want to praise the Lord, right? So if you're new with us, I want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here. We pray every week that God would bring new people into our house, and we're thankful that you came, and our prayer is that two things would happen. One, you would feel warmly welcomed here. We pray that in church you wouldn't feel nervous or you wouldn't feel like you can't be yourself, but instead that you would feel warmly welcomed and actually that people notice you. So I pray that that happens. And two, I pray that you would encounter God. I pray that, that God would just move in your heart. I'm praying that God gets a hold of us this morning. I don't want to do religion. I want to experience the presence of God. We're already experiencing him, but I believe he has something for us in the word this morning, and I'm excited to share that. But if we haven't met, my name's Daniel. I'm the lead pastor, and we was saying... And again, I'd love to meet you. So a couple weeks ago, I shared my story of how I came to faith in Christ. I'd grown up in the church. I've always been a Christian, really. But, but this was my you know, experience of really getting to know Jesus for myself. And this happened right before I came to college. I had hit rock bottom. I had done everything that I never thought I would do. And I got to this place where I just felt so deeply flawed, so flawed that I didn't think that Jesus could love me anymore. And I was weeping before God. I was asking him if he could forgive me, and I was shocked when instead of abandoning me, I actually felt God more powerfully and clearly in that moment than I ever had before. He told me that he wasn't done with me yet, but instead he wanted uh, to use me despite those failures that I had. And one of the things I was most concerned about right after I came back to Jesus was if I'd be able to find a good Christian wife, because I had really screwed up. I'd done some dumb things. And I can remember asking my mom. I was laying in my bed crying. My mom prayed for me. And I asked my mom, like, right afterwards. It's like my primary concern. I was like, Mom, do you think there's going to be a Christian girl out there who will actually want to be with me after all the things I've done? And she assured me that there would be. And she said that if the girl would hold uh, your past against you, then she probably doesn't love Jesus. And, and that encouraged me. But I didn't know how quick God was going to answer that prayer. You see, about a month later... I met my wife Emily at the first uh, Chi Alpha service that ever happened on the campus of UNI. There was like 20 of us there. Uh, Chi Alpha is our campus ministry that we're connected with as a church. I, I met her at that campus ministry, and then God kind of, you know, did some stuff. But before I met her, okay, so before I met her, I had already uh, started trying to find my wife on the campus. I had been there for about seven days, and I already found two other girls that I liked, Okay. <laughs> So one girl I found on Facebook, and she had some great profile pictures. I was like, hey, and she was a Christian, and she liked the same band that I liked. So I'm like, okay, that girl is possible. So we chatted a bit. I don't think we ever actually talked in person. But, but, uh, but then this other girl was a girl I met at a different campus ministry. Because that first week at UNI, I don't know if, for students if you did this, but I went to like every campus ministry I could. And I had already met a different girl in a different campus ministry. And we already kind of started dating or hanging out, whatever you want to call it. And, yeah, so I couldn't really pursue Emily uh, right away, and I wasn't trying to. I was interested in, in this other girl. But anyways, that happened for about a month, and uh, God got a hold of me, and he spoke clearly to me in a service like this. It was a Chi Alpha service. He spoke clearly and said, Daniel, you need to give up that relationship. That relationship is not from me. That's something that you came up with on your own. I have something better for you. So I had to break it off right after we had really, you know, just started dating, and, and that led to hurt feelings, and it was one of the hardest things I've done and in the following weekend, we went to the Chi Alpha Fall Retreat. Yeah, so Fall Retreat's coming up, students. Coming up. All right. So, yeah, come on. Seriously, if you don't go to Fall Retreat, I don't know. I'm going to do something about it. But, uh, but, hey, here's what's really cool about Fall Retreat. This is in two weeks from now, right, Derek? Where's Derek at? Okay, Taylor, two weeks from now, okay? So, in two weeks, we're going to have Fall Retreat on Friday and Saturday up in Waverly. And then on Sunday, we're bringing Fall Retreat to church, okay? So... Uh, so we're going to have an incredible worship leader joining us, like, like one of the best I know. I'm not exaggerating. One of the best I know, and honestly, one of the best preachers I know, too. Like, I'm not, like, making this up. I'm not trying to hype it up. Like, literally, one of the best worship leaders and one of the best preachers I know in America are coming here to Scent Church in two weeks, okay? And then next week, yeah, so be, so seriously, be here. And then next week, we have a missionary coming, and be here and bring your checkbooks, because this girl is going to 
well, I don't think we write checks anymore. Some of us write checks. For those of us that write checks, praise God. But bring your checkbook, bring your phone, bring your cash, whatever. We want to support this missionary. It'll be our first missionary that comes to, uh, to share with us. She'll share a window. And I want to bless her socks off. Or I don't want to show her it doesn't matter how young we are as a church or how young our church is in age. We can give and we can be generous. So be prepared for that. But I don't know where I was. Oh, I was talking about fall retreat. Okay, my freshman year. Okay, so I made this decision to, uh, to, or to tell Jesus. I said, okay. So God really got my heart. He really transformed my heart that weekend even more so. And I told the Lord, I said, okay, God, I'll be single for a year. Because I realized that, that girls had become an idol in my life. I was always trying to make it work. I, I was always talking to different girls. It seemed like every other week I had a new girl that I was interested in. And I told God, I said, okay, I'll stop doing this for a whole year. Okay, so then fast forward about five hours later. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> seriously though so so five hours later i'm in des moines at a concert with emily <laughs> not just her it was a group of us okay we happen to be in the same group and uh and she forgot her uh i think i paid for her ticket or something because she forgot something but you know the love started kind of happening there but but we became friends and then like it was a really long journey about two weeks later we started dating so uh <laughs> and then about 20 months after that we got married so yeah, so praise God. Come on, God comes through, right? <laughs> so thank you for Emily, yeah. But here's the thing. I can remember one night I was in the lounge in Hageman talking to Emily. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, which, hey, you shouldn't do that. Don't hang out with girls till 2 o'clock in the morning, guys. But anyways, we're sitting there, we're talking before we started dating. And I remember I could just like sense the Holy Spirit like saying to me, this is the girl that you've dreamed of. This is the girl that I made for you. This is the girl that you need. And you tried to figure it out on your own, but you were wrong. You're a really bad God. I'm a good God. I know what you need. And, you know, maybe I should have stayed single for a year because I did make that oath, right? So I don't know. But point is, I committed and said, God, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm done looking for it. And I genuinely was. I meant it. I, it, wasn't, it took me a couple weeks to figure it out with Emily, even though all the things were coming together because I was so, like, wanting to not pursue that. But God brought it to me. And, and and the reason I share that with you is I feel like a lot of times we try to like work things out in our life. We have these things that become primary things in our life, things that become ultimate things, things that come over God, and we try to figure it out on our own. We put these things on a pedestal, and we're trying to, or trying to manipulate everything and make it work, whether that be our career or academics or whatever, and God is just saying, if you would surrender that to me and put me first, I would take care of that thing. So for me, my thing was relationships, and that might be you. Maybe you're desperately trying to find a spouse, right? Maybe you really want to find a spouse if you're single here, and, and you think about it all the time, and you put it over the Lord. Or maybe you are married, but you put your spouse on a pedestal, or you put your boyfriend or girlfriend on a pedestal, and you put them before God. For some of us, it could even be sports. Like, there are friends of mine that, seriously, sports is an idol in their life. Like, like back when the coronavirus first started breaking out, and March Madness was or March Madness was canceled, I thought, like, some buildings were going to get burned down. I'm kidding. That didn't really happen. But, but, like, when sports started getting canceled, there were people that were seriously, like, panicking about it. And for others, it, it can be achievement and success. We put achievement and success at the top of our priority list. I'm sure there's students in here who put academics before God or put it on a pedestal. I'm sure there's some of us who put our careers before God and even before our families. Or maybe for some of us, family is that thing that's most important. We might say we follow Jesus, but really, our Lord is our family. Our God is our family. Uh, you know, we love God, but, but family is even more important to us. And for us parents, if we're honest, sometimes our children can become little gods in our lives. And still others might put comfort or ease of living at the top of our priorities. We don't want to do anything outside of our comfort zone. The God of our lives happens to be comfort and safety. Or maybe... For some of us, money is what comes before us and God. And we let God have a say in every area of our lives besides our finances. We don't trust him in that area. We don't share it with others. We don't put it towards kingdom efforts. I don't know where you're at this morning, but I know that we all struggle. No one's exempt from this sermon, including me. This week, this sermon was hard to write. God was coming at me. And honestly, like, this is going to be the most convicting sermon I've preached so far. And some of you are like, wait, I thought the other ones were really convicting. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So uh, let's see how it goes. All right, so this morning, Jesus wants to be the Lord of our lives. And he wants everything else to come under him. And with that said, this series has come alive. We're continuing this series. It's all about how Jesus wants to breathe life over the dead spaces of our hearts or, or the dead spaces of our lives. He wants to wake us up from our spiritual slumber 
and call us into his dream, call us into his love and his purposes for our lives. And, and we've done this by discussing different gifts. We're kind of just like going through the gospel, like what Jesus you know, gives us through the gospel. We've talked about forgiveness and how that helps us come alive. We've talked about uh, the resurrection and how that helps us come alive. We talked about how God adopts us and calls us sons and daughters. That was a couple weeks ago. And then last week, we, uh, we talked about how the Holy Spirit becomes our friend and he begins to guide and lead us in our lives. And now this week, uh, we're going to talk about lordship. So this gift that Jesus can be our king, Jesus can be our master. We don't have to be our master. And when we truly make him the Lord, we come alive. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. And this part of Matthew is detailing what Jesus did as he journeyed towards, or towards Jerusalem where he would be crucified. So he's headed towards his death. He's headed towards laying it all on the line for God. And as he prepares to give up everything himself for the world by dying on a cross, in this passage, in verse 16 of chapter 19, we see that Jesus expects his followers to follow us or to follow a similar path he expects us to go on the road to jerusalem so to speak and die to ourselves he calls us to to lay it all on the line and say we are going to follow jesus with our whole hearts i can remember when i first came to christ this passage messed with me so much and i've never preached on it so this week i was planning on preaching on a different passage and this happened to be in my devotional time on friday and god said you need to preach this passage i've I've not avoided it, but it, 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 it does mess with me, and it's a tough passage to preach, but I believe as we jump into this, it's going to unlock something in our lives, okay? So I'm excited for it. Let's read verse 16. It says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, he said, he said Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these I've kept, and what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions, and Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and he said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his, on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers, or not mothers, or mother, singular, or children or lands, for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, in the last first. All right, let's pray over this. Jesus, I pray that you'd give me words to say this morning. I pray that every heart would be open to what you want to say. God, I pray that there be no person, including me in this room, who shuts you down during this message because we don't want to hear what it has to say. So, so Spirit, I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that you'd get to us. I pray that at the end of this message, each of us would make a decision to say, you are Lord, and nothing is going to come over you in our lives. All right, God, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a man approaches Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Matthew doesn't give us a ton of information about who this man is, but, but the story is also, there's also told in Mark and Luke. And in Mark, we see that this man is an eager and devout man as he runs up to Jesus and he kneels down before him. So he's eager. And then in Luke, we see that this man is referred to as a ruler. Okay, so he's a man of, of prestige. He, he rules over things. And this earnest, successful man is obviously of the opinion that he can do something to earn salvation. He thinks that the way into life with God is by doing some great deed or some great act. And Jesus says, if you want to enter life, you must keep the commandments. The man was disappointed. He's like, I've heard that before. I, I would like to hear something new. And he says to Jesus, he says, what do I still lack? He thought he had 
had kept all the rules. He thought he was religious. He thought he was a good person, but he still felt like he was falling short. He had this God-sized hole in his heart, and he knew that he needed something more. He was realizing that good wasn't good enough. Okay, so the first point this morning is this. Our good deeds and our religious actions are not enough. This man thought that there must be something, something that he could do to to accommodate for the deficiency in his heart. And just before the story, if you look back, just right before the story, you can look in your Bibles, Jesus says, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must become like a little child. Okay, so what Matthew is doing by putting these stories next to each other is he's contrasting uh, the little child with this rich young ruler. The ones who enter into the kingdom of God are like children in God's arms. They're not trying to earn something, but instead they're enjoying the Father's love and they're loving him back. They have this childlike faith. But the ones who are left out are the ones who try to earn it. The ones who try to earn God's love, who think they can bring something to the table. Before we can ever come to saving faith in Jesus, we have to realize that our best deeds and our religious actions are not good enough. Just as a child knows that they can't do life on their own, right? There has to be this heart saying, I can't do it. God has to do it. Okay, so Isaiah 64, 6 says this. It says, all of us have become like one who's unclean, and, and all of our, our righteous acts are like filthy rags, and we all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our, our sins uh, sweep us away. Okay, so we must first realize that good is not good enough. Even our righteous actions are like filthy rags in God's eyes. Okay, so when you're doing good, it's not like God's super impressed. Like, wow, you did good today. You held the door for your neighbor. Good job. No, our righteous deeds are filthy rags in God's eyes. Without Jesus doing an inward work, without the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sins, we are spiritually defective and there's nothing we can do about it. This man's feeling of spiritual emptiness even after accumulating wealth and becoming a ruler and being a religious person, is something that all humans have experienced. A few years ago, I came across a quote from Jim Carrey. Who knows Jim Carrey in here? Does everybody know Jim Carrey? Most people? Okay, if you've heard of The Mask, right? I don't know. There's other movies out there. Bruce Almighty. Anyways, he's an actor. He was really popular in the early 2000s and the 90s. But anyways, Jim, he's achieved the American dream, right? He, or he was an American icon, and he probably has more money and fame than any one person needs. But, but when he was looking back on his life and all the things he's achieved, he said this. He said, I think everybody should get, or get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. So Jim, he's achieved about everything you could want to achieve. He, he's lived his wildest dreams. He's gotten the money. He's gotten the fame. And yet he even says that it's still not the answer. And you see this all throughout famous people in our country. You see them saying this kind of stuff over and over again. And the rich young man was experiencing this. But he wasn't just someone who had worldly success. He was actually religious and a good person. And he was still feeling that way. I think many of us can relate with Jim and with the rich young man. I believe we're all on a search for the good life. We search for it in relationships or in money or in success or in building a social media platform or in some religious activity. In relationships and money and success and and these religious activities, Actions are not bad in and of themselves, but they make for really crummy gods. You see, whatever we make these things, in, or whenever we make these good things into ultimate things, they become sin and they lead us to despair. Okay, let me give you a few examples. If you make money into an ultimate thing, it becomes greed. If you make food into an ultimate thing, it becomes gluttony. If you make sex, which is actually a good thing inside marriage, hallelujah, but if you make it into a good thing or into an ultimate thing, it becomes sexual immorality. Okay, so whenever we take good gifts from God and make them ultimate things, it becomes sin. And we have a way of doing that. We try to take these things and put them on a pedestal and say, they're going to satisfy me. They're going to make me feel good or or make me feel like I've achieved a good life. And they always come up short. Timothy Keller said this. He said, the human heart is an idol factory that takes good things like a successful career or love or material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. Our hearts deify them. They make them gods and, and, and they become the center of our lives because we think that they can give us significance and security and safety and fulfillment if we attain them. Okay, so let me ask you this morning, what has been the God of your life? Is it Jesus or is it something else? 
If it's something else, it's going to leave you asking, just like this man, what do I still lack? We need to know that, that no good thing can satisfy us on its own. And no good thing can give us eternal life. Even our religious actions and good deeds are not enough. Okay, so the man is realizing this, and he comes to Jesus and says, what must I do? And then Jesus says this. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So the second point this morning is this. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. If we want life with Jesus, we must totally, utterly, completely surrender to him. Jesus tells the man that if he wants to be perfect, or in some translations, if he wants to be complete, if he wants to fix the problem in his heart, he must sell everything and give to the poor and follow Jesus. He must totally, utterly surrender to Jesus and walk away from his old life. And he is unable to answer that call, and he leaves Jesus. This young man was looking for a brilliant new insight. He was looking for a silver bullet for how he could enter into the kingdom of God. He wanted to be told what he could do to once and for all secure his eternal salvation and his entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Instead, he was reminded of the old commandments that he knew from the time he was a boy. And he thought that he had kept all the commandments, but Jesus knew that he hadn't. See, he hadn't kept the first of the Ten Commandments. That commandment is, have no other gods before me. He had not kept the first one. He kept a lot of the other ones, but not the first one. He had other gods before God. His God was money and possessions. See, gods aren't just like spiritual beings. Our gods can be these different things in our lives. We can deify them. Just, or just as Israel made gold into a calf in the desert and worshipped it, we can take things that God gives us and make them into little gods. He was told that if he really wanted to follow Jesus, if he really wanted to be wholly devoted to Jesus, he was going to have to crush that God on the altar and follow him. This man was not wholly devoted to God. He was not devoted in such a way where God came before everything else. So Jesus, he, he's making it clear that if you want to be his disciple, then you need to obey the first commandment. You have to be wholly devoted to him. Life is not a pie where you give Jesus a piece of it. Our life is something that instead we completely offer up to Jesus. We have to totally surrender to him. So this looks different for each disciple. Okay, So some of you are like, dang it, I need to sell everything today. I'm not saying you don't have to. You might have to, right? I don't know. Are you the rich young man? I don't know. But this looks different for everybody, okay? So not every disciple needs to sell everything and give to the poor. But, but for this man, the money in his life had become his God, and if he was truly to surrender to Jesus, or Jesus knew if he was going to really surrender, he would give it all up, at least for a season. If he would do this, then he would have treasure in heaven. So hear me here. The passage is not telling us that to get into heaven, we have to do certain things or good works. It isn't even telling us that we can't have possessions or money. What it's telling us is if we are truly following Jesus, and if we've truly been changed by his love, we will get, or get rid of anything that comes between us and him. We will bring the totality of our life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. If wealth is your God, when you come to faith in Christ, you will seriously alter your relationship with it. And you may even decide to sell everything to follow him. And we see elsewhere in, or we see elsewhere in the Gospels that, that two rich men, Zacchaeus and Matthew, did this. They, they sold things and they followed Jesus. We see with the disciples, they left their professions. They dropped their nets. They were fishermen. They left the life of fishing to follow Jesus. They left the things that were most important to them. The point is not that you sell everything. The point is not that you leave everything but it's that you remove anything that comes between you and God. And for this man, he was unable to answer the call. He he went away sorrowful because he was unwilling to put Jesus over this area of his life. And this showed, it just revealed his heart towards God. It wasn't like he's going to hell because he didn't do that. It it just revealed what was already in his heart. He was not really committed to God. His heart was not God's. For me, before I was really committed to Jesus, I used to play the Madden video game every single night. And I'm telling you, if I didn't get to play it, it was not a good day. I, seriously, if I didn't get to play Madden, I felt like I didn't seize the day, and my parents know it's true. Because every night at 8.20, I'd be running downstairs. I got 40 minutes before bedtime. Got to play that game. And that's how you know that something's become a God in your life. If you need to do it every day, if you need to have it to feel like you're happy. 
If you, or if you say you can't live without something, it might be your God. And now that I follow Jesus, I still own Madden. It's the two-year-old Madden, okay, so it makes me holy, right? I haven't ran out and bought the new one yet. I might, though. I'm thinking about it. But it, so it's not that I don't own Madden, but I, I don't play it that much. I play it once in a while when it just happens to be where my kids are down. It's not like 10 o'clock at night, and Emily has something else to do. So it happens like, like once a year, okay? So it's a good time, though. Those 20 minutes, I'm telling you, it really helps me seize the year. But uh, <laughs> so what in your life is something that you can't live without? What's something that you feel like you have to have to be happy and content? Is it Netflix? Everyone's like, oh, dang. Is it TikTok? Okay, I don't have TikTok yet. I haven't given in, but I know people love TikTok. Okay, it might be TikTok. Is it Facebook? That's my struggle. I struggle with Facebook. I like to scroll the feed. There's not a lot of good stuff on there lately, but I don't know. It's probably an addiction. I need to deal with that after service. We're having some altar time. I need to confess that. But anyways, I just confessed it. All right, okay. So a certain, <laughs> is it a certain kind of food? For me, it's, you know, chicken strips. And do not make fun of me for that. I've been made fun of for that my whole life. I don't want to be made fun of. So I'm saying it here. We're leaving it here. Okay, if you come out to eat with me, do not make fun of me. All right. Is it video games? Is it a certain amount of money in the bank account? Like you have to have this number to feel good. What's that thing in your life that you think about the most? What's that thing that you would sacrifice everything for? I really hope it's not Madden, right? We're not going to sacrifice everything for Madden. But, but more serious things, what is that thing? If you, if you want to follow Jesus, he must become that thing. He must be your source of happiness. He must be the one that you would lay it all on the line for. If you truly encountered his great love, you'll want to do nothing less than that. It's not going to be a chore. It's going to be what you want to do. Like, I know this Jesus now. I have to lay it all on the line for him. I just love him so much. I want nothing to come between me and him. It's not an effort thing. It's not a grit your teeth thing. Instead, it's an encounter where you experience his love and you respond to it. This may feel like a heavy burden for you this morning. If this seemingly blessed man had who had kept all the commandments, couldn't truly surrender to God, then how can we? How can we possibly surrender enough to enter into the kingdom? And the disciples were worried about this too. Let's keep reading. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus, he looked at them, and he said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Okay, so it's still possible. The third point this morning is this. Total surrender is only possible when Jesus awakens our hearts. Okay, so total surrender, again, it's not something you do by, by mere willpower. It's impossible on our own to surrender. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's something, this surrendering to God is something that starts with God working in your heart. He takes the initiative. It starts with you coming alive in Christ and realizing his love for you. And then out of that, you make him your Lord and you put him before everything else. The Bible says in 1 John, I believe it is, we love because he first loved us, right? We don't love and then he loves us. We love because he first loved us. After this man walks away full of sorrow, Jesus turns to his disciples and he tells them that it's extremely difficult for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's not saying that the rich won't enter at all, but just that it's particularly hard for them because wealth is very dangerous for the human heart. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says this, he says, For the love of money, so not money, but the love of money, is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves. They're like hurting themselves with many pangs. Jesus talked about money a lot. I think sometimes we like to skip over those passages, right? He talks about it all the time. Because he knew that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. We have a way of getting wrapped up into how much money we have and how much we own. See, money and possessions can tempt us to try to be self-sufficient. If we want Jesus to be Lord, we can't be self-sufficient. Instead, we have to surrender our self-sufficiency to him and be totally and utterly dependent upon him. 
This doesn't just apply to the rich, though. So if you're poor in here, don't be saying, yeah, rich people. (laughs) It applies to anybody who makes money in an idol, and I know poor people do that a lot, too. You can be rich or poor. It applies to all of us. Even with that said, Jesus is making the point that if you acquire a lot of money, it can be harder to, to not let money grip you. It's harder for a rich man because, or it's harder for a rich man to become like a little child and receive the kingdom than it is for a poor man because a rich man is more tempted to rely upon himself because he knows he can. Jesus goes as far to say that it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I look at that, I, I think about a needle, I think about a camel. That doesn't seem possible. Can rich people get to heaven? And that's what was, that's what the disciples were wondering. This would have been shocking to them too. You got to realize in this culture, if you were rich, it was viewed that you were blessed. It's this idea that if you have money, that shows that God is on your side. So the disciples are like, oh my goodness, what's going on? This is going against everything I ever knew. I thought, I thought money and possessions was a sign of God's blessing. And this causes them to ask, who then can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, I got no chance. And Jesus then looks at them, and some translations say that he fixes his gaze upon them. So this idea that he looks really hard at them. I think about Jesus looking hard at me. That's scary. But anyways, he's looking hard at them. And he says, yes, yes, you're right. It's impossible for you to be saved on your own. But take heart. With God, anything is possible. God is not limited by our barriers. God can crush our idols. He's capable of revealing himself in such a way where we don't want those things anymore. Jesus can save anybody. All right, Saving is something that he does. It's not something we do on our own strength. And not even the difficulty of wealth and possessions can stop the power of God. Salvation happens when God wakes us up, not when we do something. So God can even wake up rich people. Okay, so it says this, or this is a quote from a commentator. I like to read commentators who talk about the passage. And he talked about this on Matthew. He said, he said, salvation depends on the action of God, not the achievement of the creature. Okay, so salvation, it depends on the action of God, not on the achievement of a creature. Okay, so with that in mind, we need to know that this message, it's not about us trying harder. So if you walk out here saying, I'm going to grip my teeth this week and try really, really hard to be more religious, that's not the call of this message. We can't totally surrender to Jesus by trying harder. Instead, we have to fall in love with him. We have to really love him. We have to say, I love him, not just like I'm doing religious stuff. We have to really love Jesus. And we have to have an encounter with him. If you love him, it won't be that hard. Surrender is on the other side of an encounter. When you encounter this Jesus, he's better than anything this world can offer you. And you know that, so you say, I'll give it all up. Total surrender can only happen after that happens. So I pray that you would know that God is calling you into an encounter this morning, not into you trying harder. Your religious actions are part of the problem. You think you're earning something. That's not the call. So for me, after I encountered this love of Jesus, I was like, take it all away. Take it, take it. I don't want it. I started giving up things left and right. I remember I had a bunch of filthy movies. And by filthy, I mean just like terrible jokes, okay? Like the worst jokes, like sexual jokes. I remember I had a bunch of movies in my dorm room. I still brought them to you and I, so I was a work in progress. Okay, I had them there. I can remember one day I was like, I need to give these movies away. So I get them all up. I stack them up. I walk down my dorm hallway and pass them out to my friends. Okay, I should have thrown them away, right? What an idiot, right? I was the president of Chi Alpha, passing out dirty movies to my friends. But I felt like it was a waste to throw them away. But the point is, I wasn't doing that because I thought it earned me something. I was doing that because I was encountering Jesus in my prayer and my Bible time, and I was saying, okay, this grieves his heart. How could I want to hold on to this stuff? If you're struggling to make God first in your life, I urge you, do what it takes to get your priorities straight. Yes, obey Jesus, but, but the most important thing is for you to lean into God and to see that he's better than life, and to let him change your heart. It's not about effort, but it's about his work in your heart. As we've talked about in recent weeks, there are ways to position yourself in such a way where you can uh, receive an encounter from God, right? There's ways to kind of get into his presence, and and different ways we've talked about it is like confessing your sin. That's a great way to stop hiding things, but, but to share it. And that's what small groups are for. You can also do it through spending time in the Word and prayer. We would love to see every person in our church reading the Bible every day and praying. It can come through making church a priority. Say, I'm going to be there no matter what. I'm going to be there every week. 
You can come through being a small group and come through these different things. You can, you know, position yourself to receive from God and, and to get into his presence. If we want God to make our hearts come to life, if we want him to help us to make him the first thing in our, in our lives, we have to get into his presence. And then, as we're in his presence, when he calls us to make changes, we have to make those changes, just as he asked this man to make a change. He was literally in the presence of Jesus, and that wasn't enough for him, right? So, so we have to position ourselves into the presence of God and then respond to Jesus as he speaks to us. Okay, so after seeing Jesus' interaction with a young man and seeing how hard it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, Peter wonders what the reward will be for those who, or who do leave it all for Jesus. Okay, so, so verse 27. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will... S- the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands, for, for my name's sake, we will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But, but many who are first will be last and the last first. The last point this morning is this. Again, hallelujah, I feel like people want to praise at this point. So, so when we totally surrender, sorry, that was a bad joke. When we totally surrender, I'll tell you when my jokes are bad, okay? We don't have to have it be like the elephant in the room. That was a bad joke. Okay, so fourth point. Uh, when we totally surrender to the lordship of Jesus, we will find life and receive a great reward. Okay, so after hearing how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom, Peter had to wonder if he had done enough. He felt that he and the other disciples had sacrificed so much for Jesus and and he wanted to know if it was enough to enter into the kingdom. So, so when he says see here at the beginning of the sentence in, in verse 27, it's an emphatic expression. We can't see it in the English, but in the Greek it's emphatic. It's like it's an emotional moment for him. And then Jesus begins his response with truly I say to you, which is also emphatic. So it's this passionate moment between Jesus and Peter. We can't see it by, by reading it here, but it's, it's an intimate and passionate moment. So they're locking eyes and Peter's asking, is it enough? Peter wanted to know if the sacrifices he made was enough, and he wanted to know what the reward was. And Jesus is looking at Peter, and he's thinking, you're my beloved, Peter. I have a glorious inheritance awaiting you. Of course, it's enough. Okay, so many times in, in moments like this, Jesus will speak of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him, which is actually the passage I was going to do, so that would have been fun too. But in this moment, he didn't feel the need to go that direction. Instead, he wanted to encourage Peter because he knew that Peter left everything to follow him, and he wanted Peter to know that it's all going to be worth it. He wanted him to be encouraged. Okay, so Jesus, he explains that in the new world, in the new heavens and earth that's coming at the end of the age, the 12 disciples will, are going to sit on the 12 thrones judging the, twi- or the 12 tribes of Israel. So although the Father and the Son are judges, somehow the disciples are joining in. I don't really know what that looks like, and the commentators don't either, okay? So it's not like I'm missing something. We just don't know. We don't know what that looks like. Okay, so, but in some way, uh, they're going to get to order the affairs of heaven. So this is a great reward for these disciples, but, and they would all, besides one, end up dying for Jesus. So what Jesus is saying, he knew that. He knew that 10 of them, you know, Judas betrays him, and then John doesn't die for Jesus, but, but he knew that they would all have to die for him, and Jesus is saying, it's going to be worth it, guys. It's going to be worth it. Hang on. It will be worth it. And then Jesus pivots. And he speaks to all disciples over all time. So that includes you and I who are Christians in here. Okay, so, and he says to us, he says, if you leave houses or family members, then you're going to receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. He's saying, if we leave our old lives and follow him, we're going to get a great reward. Okay, so he uses these examples of houses and family members because sometimes we need to leave those things that bring us comfort to follow Jesus. We need to bring those things that are our top priorities to him and leave them. You know, missionaries must literally do this as they go overseas and they leave, like literally their house, and they leave their families to go overseas and to be missionaries. But, but for those of us who aren't missionaries, we need to leave, or sometimes we need to leave family members or old lifestyles because of the opposition that they bring to us following Jesus. So hear Jesus this morning. If you're married, he's not telling you to abandon your spouse. If you have children, he's not telling you to leave your, two, or to leave your two-year-old behind and just go do your thing, okay? That's not what he's saying. And we have to take this in context with the rest of Scripture. What he's saying is sometimes our parents or our siblings or other family members can oppose us in such, or in such a way where we have to leave them or, or kind of let that relationship be broken in a way so we can follow Jesus. He says that people who do this will receive a reward a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. 
Okay, so it's important to understand that Jesus, he's not calling us to some impoverished existence. And he doesn't want to just take away everything we enjoy and love in life. That's not his purpose. Instead, he calls us to sacrifice those things that stand in the way of following him, and he promises a rich reward if we do. Because when we do this, we enter into abundant life. In John 10, 10, it says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Psalm 16, 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. This is David talking about Jesus, you make, or God. He says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So what I'm saying to you is God does not want to take your fun away. That's not his goal. Instead, he knows that if you lay it all on the line for him, you're going to have more joy than you ever had before. You're going to have life abundant. You're going to enter into a fullness of joy, and at your right hand there's pleasures forevermore. Come on, it's worth it to give it all for Jesus. He's not trying to steal your fun. He just knows what's actually fun, right? He knows what's good for you. He's a smart guy. He knows what's good for your life. So if you obey him, I promise you, on the other side of that obedience, you're going to find joy and blessing. All right, so Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary to China in the 1800s. He gave up much for God. He was British by birth, but he spent 51 years of his life in China trying to reach the nation with the gospel. His heart just, it burned for the lost there. If you read his writings, his heart, it burned for the lost people of China. He could not understand how can the British Christians sit here and not do anything about it? How can they not be concerned about the fact that the entire country of China is lost to Jesus? They're going to hell. How can they not be burdened by that? He didn't get it. And he decided that he was going to do something about it. And as he did this, as he went to China, he was often misunderstood. He took bold risks for God, like he would send single women into these different territories in China to go and preach the gospel. He took bold risks. He, he did controversial things. And he never, ever asked for money for his work and said God would always provide for him. He had to trust God in that way. Can we do that? Just say, God, bring it, and he brings it, right? We see this throughout church history, these incredible saints who God just provides for them as they do work for him. He lost his wife when she was only 33. He buried four, or four of his eight children who didn't reach the age of 10 in China. Four of them buried him in China. By all accounts, this man gave up much for Jesus. But despite this, at the end of his life, when he looked back, he's looking back on his life, and he says, he says, every time I gave something up for God, I found so much blessing on the other side of it that it didn't really feel like I was giving anything up. He said, I never made a sacrifice for God. At the time of his death, there was 825 missionaries in China under his organization with more than 300 mission stations and more than 500 Chinese helpers and 25,000 Christian converts. And there's still 1,600 missionaries working under his organization there today, over 100 years later. In 1900, there were 100,000 Christians in China, and today there's around 150 million. Christianity is booming in China. And Hudson Taylor was a pioneer in this work, in prayer and also in work. His heart burned before others' hearts burned for it. And now look what's happening. We need to remember that uh, we can never truly make a sacrifice for God. When we lay our lives down, we actually save our lives. And we end up living the abundant life that God calls us to live. This morning, you may be struggling to obey Jesus and know that if you obey him, what you find on the other side of that obedience will be so worth it. Everything's not going to be perfect. I'm not promising you that. But he will be with you, sustaining you, giving you joy, giving you purpose because he knows what's best for you, and he wants what's best for you. But not only that, he's going to call you into a life of glory. When we lay our lives down for Jesus, our lives have a glorious purpose. We actually do something that, or that matters. That's not just about, you know, building our retirement up and being able to chill out for the last 20 years of our life. Instead, we, instead we live a life of eternal impact. So the main idea this morning is this. When we come to know Jesus as Lord, we come alive. When we come to know Jesus as Lord, we come alive. I don't know where you're at this morning, but I know that the Son of God is calling you. The King of the universe is calling you. He wants you to let him be the Lord of your life. 
in American Christian culture especially, we deeply struggle with making Jesus Lord. We have all these other things that fight for our attention. Because we have so much, it's very hard to make Jesus the main thing. And we allow other things like money or success or relationships or comfort to become the God of our lives. So this morning, maybe you're coming in here or you're watching online. You have one of these cameras, you're watching. Hi, hi. Um, <laughs> I always look at this one. I realize that that one's usually the one going. So I, anyways, sorry. Back to this moment. Okay, so you may be watching or you're here and you feel like the rich young man in the story. You may do religious things. You may be a pretty good person. Actually, I know most of you, you're all pretty good people. I, I like you a lot. I enjoy hanging out with you. You're good people, right? But you still realize that you're missing it. And you're realizing that good is just not good enough. If you want to truly step into God's dream for your life, you have to lay it all down. You have to totally, utterly surrender to him. So parents, maybe your children have become the Lord of your life. They are your most important thing over Jesus. Jesus certainly calls you to be a good parent. He calls you to love your kids, but he knows you're not gonna be able to do that if your kids are Lord. If your kids are Lord, they're going to crumble under that weight. They can't fulfill you. I promise you, your kids are not going to fulfill you. Only Jesus can. But when you put Jesus first, you'll actually become a better parent who loves better and can lead better. Students, maybe your classes and academic success have become your Lord. It consumes you. You think about it all the time. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, if you put the kingdom first, if you seek the kingdom of God first, he'll add all these other things unto you. He'll take care of the rest. So students know that if you put Jesus first in college or if you're in high school or middle school, if you put Jesus first, he'll take care of the academics. As long as you work hard, you can't just not do your homework. Okay, nobody's telling you that this morning. Do your homework, okay? So don't be telling your professor, Pastor Daniel told me this, okay? But the same applies for us who are adults in this room. We often put our careers or we put our jobs over God. We put, we put our success over Jesus. And I just want to encourage you that, that no matter how much success you accumulate, it's never going to be enough. Do not make success your Lord. Okay, some have made money and possessions our Lord. And this can play as play itself out in so many different ways. It can play itself out by buying things we can't afford. It can play itself out by, by hoarding our money and shoving it all in a bank account just to make sure we're safe. Both are sin. Okay, both are sin. And Jesus needs to be the Lord of your finances. When Jesus is the Lord of your finances, you'll manage your finances wisely, which actually leads to blessing when you manage it wisely, right? And this looks like living within your means. It looks like being, or being radically generous being, or being radically open-handed with your money. Okay, some of us have, have made relationships our Lord. You may be dating someone who doesn't love Jesus. Or maybe you expect your spouse to be God to you, or to be Jesus to you. And you hold your spouse to these impossible standards because they're supposed to fulfill you. And there's this weight on them all the time because you want them to do something they can't do. They're not going to be perfect. They can't be Jesus. Only Jesus can be Jesus in your life. Only He can be Lord. And finally, some of us have have made comfort and security our Lord. We'll never do anything that goes against what's comfortable. We think whatever feels safe is what we're supposed to do all the time. That might be sometimes, but not all the time, right? I believe that as we head towards the end of 2020, God is calling us to not just do what's comfortable, but to take some risk for his kingdom, to talk to that person who needs Jesus, to give that money away, to serve on the dream team at church, to jump into small group, to do things outside of our comfort zone. I don't know what it is for you, but... I know that God is calling you not to make that your Lord and instead to say, if you ask me to do something, Jesus, I'll do it. So whatever the struggle this morning, when you make Jesus Lord, everything else falls into place. This isn't a call to an impoverished existence, remember? It's a call to abundant and joyful life. Parenting, classes, careers, money and possessions, relationships, insecurity, they all get in their proper place. And you will live the life that you were created to live because God is a better God than you are. And you're going to live a life of purpose and joy and intimacy with God. But this cannot happen on your own strength. This message, again, is not about willpower. If you want to make Jesus Lord, you have to know. You have to truly know what he's done for you. Truly know it in your heart. Not just know it in your head, but know it in your heart. The fact that Jesus Christ, when all of us were sinful, when we had all fallen short of the glory of God, he came out of security. He left comfort. He left the comfort of heaven and came to earth. And he lived this human life. 
And we know how much it can stink at times, right? Especially in 2020. Right? I'm guessing it was worse when Jesus was here in 4 BC when he was born, right? So he comes to earth and he lives the human life with all the same struggles and temptations and sickness, all these different things, all the things we've experienced. He, he came and lived in that, but at the same time, he still lived perfectly. He obeyed uh, the law of God to a T. He was perfect. He truly kept all the commandments. And then after living a perfect life, he had to experience being forsaken by his father who he had been with in eternity forever. He had to experience God turning his back on him so he could experience the judgment of God on, on the cross so we could be forgiven for our sins. Because the wages of sin is death and each of us have a penalty that needs to be paid. But Jesus Christ said, I'll pay that penalty for you. So Jesus on the cross, he, he, he takes on the wrath of God. He dies a gruesome death to pay for yours and I's sin. But not just that, after three days of being dead and buried, he comes up out of the grave, showing one, that his sacrifice was accepted, but, but two, that he's defeated death, sin, hell, and the grave. And now, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. So what's that look like? What's it look like to be saved? It looks like being forgiven for your sins. And it looks like when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus, not your struggle. He doesn't see your sin. He sees Jesus. And that looks like eternal life. And I just believe that there might be someone this morning that came in who needs to receive that eternal life this morning. And maybe you come in and you don't have right relationship with God or you once did and you walked away. And I want to give you a chance to do that. So can we bow our heads all across this room? I want to pray for you. Okay, so if that's you, if you prayed this prayer before, like last week or something, you don't need to pray it again because God saw that prayer. But, but if this is a decision you want to make today to say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want to recommit my life. I've been walking away from you for quite some time and I want to give you a chance to do that. And the way we're going to do this, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I want you to slip up your hand to heaven, just saying, hey, Jesus, I want to make you Lord. And I'm going to pray for you, and I want you to pray in your heart. So on the count of three, slip up your hand if you want to be saved. One, two, three. Slip my ball across the room. See that hand? See that hand? Is there anybody else? See that hand? See that hand? All right, so put your hands down. I'm just going to pray, and then you pray in your heart. Simple prayer of repentance and of trusting Jesus. So Jesus, this morning we come to you and we recognize that each of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Each of us have sinned. We have disobeyed you. And this morning we are thankful, Jesus, that you came and you lived the perfect life. And then you died on the cross for our sins. When you didn't need to, you did it anyways because you love us so much. And Jesus, this morning I pray that you transform hearts all across this room. God, we thank you in Jesus' name.